Hi, this is David. We are back and we are still talking about Azure Data Explorer, AEDX, and its query language, the Custo query language, KQL. In this video, I'm going to talk about some of the useful geography functions that are included with KQL. Now, I've already created a, a, an ADX cluster and I have a video on how to do that. If you want to go back in the series and take a look at that. And I've also got a database here called GCastDB that I'm using, and I can actually go out to um, dataexplorer.azure.com and open this up and make sure I'm selecting the correct database here. And I want to, you know, for this demo, I'm going to create a new table called vehicle location. So just to make sure it's not there, let me just drop it, recreate it. And you see that it has an, uh, a vehicle ID, a timestamp, and some location information, longitude and latitude. So I'll throw some bits of data in there and now we can see it. There are, there's some for vehicle one and some for vehicle two. Vehicle one has four rows right here. I can just show those right here. Um, and um, oh, I got a little ahead of myself, vehicle locations. That's what I wanted to do right here. Show them right here. Uh, vehicle one has, it looks like four and vehicle two has five rows. It'd probably be a little bit easier to see if I said order by vehicle. ID ascending right here. Um, then you can see that. The first function I want to show you is the geo distance two points. So what we talked in the last video about we can get not only the latitude and longitude of the current row, but if we sort this order by vehicle ID timestamp ascending, then we can use the pre function to get the previous values of the latitude and longitude. And that's pretty nice. Um, what would be really useful is to know how far, is, what's the distance between, do this, I wanna know what is the distance between this point and the point that comes before it. Of course, I'd wanna sort by timestamp to make that even more useful. So right here. So at 11 o'clock, 15 minutes between 1045 and 11 o'clock, how far did this travel? And I won't be exactly how far because we don't know if it goes in a straight line, but there is a function will tell you the distance between this point and that point. And that is the geo distance, oops, geo distance two points function. It's built into KQL. So let me show you that right here. Here's this function for it, and it's pretty simple. Uh, it takes four arguments, the longitude and latitude of one point and the longitude and latitude of the other point, and it just tells you how far apart they are. So that's what I can do right here. Just for vehicle one, it says, what's the distance between this point and this point in meters? It's 1,659 meters. This point and this point, 260 meters and so on. So that number is in meters. Of course, there's no previous one, so I couldn't calculate that. So now by calculating this right here, it returned this value. Very useful information just in a single function. Function. All right, that's that's one useful thing for geographic data. Another useful one is working with polygons. And a polygon can be defined as a dynamic object in KQL. And there's a few ways to do it. One of them is to take an array of points. Here I've got four point, points, actually uh, five points to close the polygon. But there they are defined there by the latitude and longitude of each. So if I take this array of points, it's an array of array because each one of this is two points, and then I call pack, that will return a dynamic object that is that polygon. And once I have a polygon object defined, then I can use this function, geo points in polygon, and I'll pass it longitude and latitude, so an existing point, and the polygon that I've defined up here, and it will return a, a Boolean, a true or a false. It'll say true if this point is in this polygon, false if it is not. And I defined this polygon, actually, I went to a site called geojson.io that allows me to draw shapes on here. So if I wanted to draw another one right here, then 
that told me the coordinates of this right here. I don't really want that anymore, so I'll just delete that one. But that's how I got these points. This is Manhattan, and happens to be a rectangle somewhere in Manhattan. So that's what I'm doing here. And what I want to know is for this given polygon right here in Manhattan, and the data that I've defined up here, just for vehicle one, I want to know which of these points that vehicle one traveled in happen to be inside of that polygon. That's what I want to know. At what times was it inside the polygon? Let's take a look. And if I run this query, see two of those points were in that polygon. I was in there at 1045 and 1130, and the other points, it happened to be outside of that polygon. So that can be useful information. Maybe you want to know if it's something is uh, uh, outside of its given area. You want to know if it's in a restricted zone. You want to know how close it is to the destination. You have this function, geo points in polygon, that will let you know that. The next thing I want to talk about is something called S2 levels. An S2 level divides the world up into rectangles. So here, this site here, s2geometry.io, does a pretty good job of explaining it. It's not real long, but there's a lot of information packed into it. And this picture tells a lot. Uh, this doesn't look like it, but these are actually rectangles. And the reason they're rectangles, even though they have curved lines, is because the Earth is curved. This is the globe projected onto a flat surface. So these are lines of latitude. Um, and this is an S2 rectangle, and this is an S2 rectangle, and that's an S2 rectangle. The reason they're different sizes is because there are different levels. When we create, when we divide the world up into S2 rectangles, we tell it what level we want to divide it up into. And those levels will defined, I think it's in this link right here. Yeah. So if you say at level zero, then that divides the world up into just six cells, each of which is about 7,800 kilometers across. These are big, big cells. But if you say S2 level 30, that'll divide the world up into seven times 10 to the 18th cells, each of which is only eight or nine millimeters across. So it depends what kind of precision do you want when you divide the world up into these. So this is one way to do that, and it can speed up queries if you just want to know is something in the same S2 cell or not? As it moves around, is it moving from one S2 cell to the other? That can sometimes be a faster query than just saying, is it um, moving, uh, you know, how far did it move? Uh, or did it move a significant amount? All right. There are functions in KQL that'll help us do that. So we have not only distance between two points, but if I come down to these function help, this entire section, this is the geospatial section, we have geo point to S2 cell, which is really useful. It'll just take a, a longitude and latitude and a level, and it'll give it a number or a, a GUID that represents that S2 cell. So every S2 cell has a unique, not a GUID, but a, a unique uh, string of characters and numbers. And let me, an example will probably clarify that. So if I come down here and I say that right here in my vehicle locations, remember this is all of my vehicle locations, right there, they all have a longitude, they all have a latitude, so I can extend it. I'll just do it just for vehicle ID equals two. Why don't I do it for all of them? There's no reason why it should just be two. Then I can see, but when I do that, I probably want to sort them. Order I vehicle ID. There we go. So there's the two ones. And these ones you can see, this is at level nine right here. These three points are in the same S2 location. Even though they're different points, they do move a little bit. They have the same S2 location at level nine. And level nine was, where are we here? about uh, 18 to 20 kilometers across. So that's what it's telling us here, that here was a different location. This one, these three are the same location. This is a different location, or a, different, a different S2 cell. Now, if I were to use a really small number here, now these are, remember, these are the big, big, they're many kilometers across, only six uh, uh, 
I guess it's zero has six across. There, there aren't very many <laughs> uh, regions. So they're all in that same S2 cell. But if I were to take a really small one, there's a couple millimeters across, like 30. Now they're all unique because that it's not moving. It's moving more than six or seven millimeters. So that's the idea behind the cells, and we can see this. So you want to check something. I think nine seemed to be reasonable for this data set right here. Um, for vehicle one, they all stayed in the same S2 cell. Uh, even though the numbers themselves were changing, they weren't changing nearly as much. Now, what, how is this useful? There's a couple ways we can do this. One thing might be that might be useful is that we have this, uh, we can take a polygon and convert it to S2 cells. And what that means is that, remember this polygon we used right here. Now that polygon could be divided into S2 cells. Now they won't, the S2 cells of the world won't exactly match this, no matter what level we select. In fact, if it's not a rectangle, if it's an odd shape, it definitely won't match it. But we can overlap it with the minimum number of S2 cells. And there's a function for doing that. That function is this one geo polygon to s2 cells we just pass in a polygon we pass in a level and it will return an array with the minimum s2 cells that will completely cover this polygon why is that useful well imagine if we had millions of points of data all over the world and we wanted to know what our previous functions say, you know what, which ones of these points are inside of this polygon? That's that's a lot to filter, to go through just to get this right here, uh, the points that are in here, we'd have to search through all of the points all over the world. What if we could narrow that down and say, you know what, I only want to look at points that are around this area, you know, somewhere in central Manhattan. Those are the ones that I care about. I'll filter down to that first, and once I have that, then I'll, I'll look in those points and figure out which ones are inside of this polygon. That would be a lot faster. So that's a really good case, uh, a use case for using this. And here's the code for doing that. In this case, I have, I'm getting the S2 cell of every single location using this geo point to S2 cells, that, that's a, uh, uh, give me the location of the G, the S2 cell of every single one of these. I happen to be using uh, the level 12 here. And when I filter it, I filter on only those points that are inside of this S2 array. So it's not really a big deal for this one because I got a data set with only uh, what, um, nine records then. But what if I had millions of records? This would filter it down considerably, especially if those millions of records were scattered all over the world. And then when I do my where clause, where geo point in polygon, this geo point in polygon, which will turn true if it's in the polygon and false if it's not, it's not it's not looking at all those millions of rows. It's only looking at those that are, happen to be in this S2 set, which just overlaps my polygon by just a little bit. So we do that, we get the same results here as we did when I didn't overlap with a polygon right here, but it should, this one should run much, much faster for large data sets. There's the use case for using this. And when I talk about these things, I'm, I'm just giving an example because if you look at things at the geo functions, there are really similar ones. So for example, there's the, I showed you the geo distance between two points. You can do the distance between a, a point and a given polygon. Uh, you can do, uh, you can not only do tell whether a point is inside of a polygon, but you can tell whether the point is inside of a circle, if you know that it's a circle, things like that. So there are other things as well that will do that. We can point to polygon, we get a central point of the polygon from the S2 cell, it's essentially the reverse of taking a, a longitude latitude and converting to S2. Let's take an S2 and convert it into a point, but because the S2 is a rectangle and a point is a point, it'll just assume the central point of that. So we've got all sorts of functions here that we can deal with when working with geographic data. And that is a strength of K2 or of, K, uh, of KQL that other query languages generally don't have. In this video, I've shown you how to use KQL to analyze geographic data.
This is David. Thank you for watching. Thank you.